Yuval Noah Hari's book, Sapiens, is the macro history, big and long-term historical events of the development of Homo sapiens. The book progresses generally in a linear fashion. However, there are some pages where it jumps across time periods to connect similar phenomena. It explains how the world has come to be the way it is, by describing the various revolutions that shaped the human history. As an added advantage, the book also reimagines the history with a different turnout of events. At the end of the book, Sapiens gives a warning that modern humans have become gods because they are capable of starting new evolutionary paths and ending them as well. This includes our own historical path. This book is based on facts backed up by research, but involves a bit of hypothesizing as well. In the book, Hari sometimes states that an idea is simply a theory and not yet proven. However, in some situations, he states his opinions as if they were absolute. This book also contains exaggerations that will benefit from the reader's further scrutiny and fact-checking. Despite these drawbacks, the book contains ample insight that will satisfy those who want to deeply understand human history from beginning to the end. Hari also shares his own feelings with the readers, like the fact that Guns, Germs, and Steel, 1997, by Jared Diamond, is one of his greatest inspiration for writing the book. According to him, Jared's book taught him that it was possible to ask the big questions and answer them through science. Likewise, Sapiens goes beyond discussing mere historical facts. He attempts to draw insights from it to answer essential queries like, what is the difference between Homo sapiens and other species? Whether history has a direction, if people became happier throughout time, and other fascinating topics. It provides new perspectives that give a more holistic understanding of who we are as a species. Sapiens was originally written in Hebrew and published in Israel in 2011. It was translated into English in 2014. It's been translated into more than 20 languages so far and has gained worldwide recognition for being such an insightful book. Yuval Noah Hari is an Israeli historian who was raised by a non-religious Eastern European family. He first studied military and medieval history at Jerusalem's Hebrew University from 1993 to 1998. He received his doctorate from the Oxford University in 2002 under the guidance of Professor Stephen J. Gunn. He continued his postdoctoral studies in Hebrew as a fellow of Yad Hanadiv, a philanthropic foundation in Israel. He now focuses on world history and macro-historical processes. Aside from Sapiens, Hari has published several notable books about history, such as Special Operations in the Age of Chivalry, 1100-1550, Renaissance Military Memoirs, War, History, and Identity, 1450-1600 The Ultimate Experience, Battlefield Revelations and the Making of Modern War Culture, 1450-2000 The Concept of Decisive Battles in World History Armchairs, Coffee and Authority, Eyewitnesses and Flesh Witnesses Speak About War, 1100-2000 Homo Deus a Brief History of Tomorrow Hari had given a free online course titled A Brief History of Humankind. This course elaborated on the information given in the book. More than a 100,000 people all over the world enrolled for the course. Sapiens is a book about the development of Homo sapiens, a term that means wise man. From beginning, an animal with no significance, to the, to the animal that became a god. The book reviews thousands of years of history, considers diverse empires and cultures, and relates them in an engaging and easy-to-understand manner. Human history is complex, and there are many things we don't know about it, because of the lack of artifacts or other reliable evidence. But the author says that it can generally be grouped into three revolutions. The Cognitive Revolution, the Agricultural Revolution, and the Scientific Revolution. These three have influenced almost everything about humankind. We are currently in the scientific revolution, a period that has turned us into gods, but at the same time made us extremely vulnerable to our own selves.
The cognitive revolution took place 70,000 years ago, when humans gained the ability to speak and create myths. This is supported by the development of larger-than-normal brains in humans, a result of using fire to cook food. Because of this increase in intelligence, humans surpassed animals and outwitted other human species. They understood their environment, communicated the information to others, and collaborated in tasks that require a large number of individuals. Eventually, they eliminated the human and animal competition, not because they were fitter, but because they were smarter. Other human species became extinct, and as people dominated the land, so did vast numbers of the local flora and fauna. After a few thousand years, Homo sapiens topped the food chain. Since this process normally takes millions of years, the ecosystem is not ready for it, and the same is with the Homo sapiens. Thus, these wise men are anxious and prone to making mistakes, with some of them great enough to affect the course of history. The agricultural revolution occurred 10,000 years ago, when people learned how to farm lands and to domesticate animals. This caused them to leave their nomadic and hunter-gathering ways in favor of semi-permanent to permanent shelters. These settlements eventually grew into cities, towns, and empires, thanks to the incredible ability of common myths to unite people. Eventually, conquests resulted into smaller cultures merging into megacultures, which inevitably led to one-world culture. It has also fashioned the economic systems that supported humankind's speedy progress. The scientific revolution began 500 years ago and is currently ongoing. It is spurred by imperialistic desires to know more and to conquer bigger territory. Capitalism, a product of the agricultural revolution, developed a relentless pursuit of profit, spurring scientific researches that provide profitable applications. At the same time, the improvement of technology bestowed endless comforts upon people who developed cravings for things they don't really need. Overall, humankind is wealthier and more powerful than at any point in history. But we're not really as happy as our ancestors. We need to think hard about what we really want so as to avoid endangering ourselves, especially now that we can not only guide history, but we can end it altogether. The Cognitive Revolution, an animal of no significance. Everything came into being about 13.5 billion years in the distant past, during the Big Bang. Only physics can be used to describe this story. 300,000 years later, energy and matter began to form atoms and molecules. Chemistry relates the story of molecules and molecular interactions. 3.8 billion years ago, some molecules collected to build organisms on the planet Earth. Biology narrates the story of organisms. 70,000 years ago, organisms from the species Homo sapien formed much more complex structures we now call culture. History expresses human culture's subsequent development. Human history is influenced by three incredible revolutions. The cognitive revolution that took place 70,000 years in the past, the agricultural revolution set at 20,000 years ago, and the scientific revolution a mere 500 years ago. This book explains how these revolutions have affected humans and other organisms on the planet. Humans, animals of the genus Homo, have existed long before history, and they lived with animals for a long time without standing apart from them. Biologists group and name organisms by their genus and species. Animals are from the same species if they mate and give birth to offspring that can bear children. We are called Homo sapiens, of the genus Homo, man, and species sapiens, wise, and we belong to the family of great apes. It's believed that six million years ago a female ape gave birth to two daughters— one became the ancestor of all present-day chimpanzees, while the other became Homo sapiens' grandmother. Humans first evolved in Africa 2.5 million years ago, from a previous genus called Australopithecus, or Southern Ape. Two million years ago, these early humans left Africa and traveled to Europe and Asia. 
Because of the varying conditions in settlement places, humans evolved. Those in Europe and Western Asia became Homo neanderthalensis, or Neanderthals, men from the Neander Valley. Those in Eastern Asia became Homo erectus, upright man. Those on the island of Java in Indonesia became Homo soliensis, man from the Solo Valley. Last but not least, those in Flores Island became Homo floriensis. Of these, Homo erectus survived the longest. While these humans were in Europe and Asia, the ones left in East Africa continued to evolve into numerous species, such as Homo rudolphinus, man from Lake Rudolph. Homo ergaster, working man, and eventually Homo sapiens, wise man. As you can see, human evolution is not linear. From about 2 million years up to 10,000 years ago, several human species coexisted. Humans have large brains compared to their body size, which uses 25% of the body's entire energy supply. In comparison, other apes only need 8%. This bigger, energy-hungry brain came at a price. Humans had to spend more time getting food, and their muscles atrophied. Despite this, the human brain has proven to be an asset for the Homo sapiens. Another thing that worked to our advantage is our ability to work upright. It freed our hands so we were able to do more things, like signaling and tool production. Again, this had some drawbacks. Humans lost their superior vision, and we can have problems such as stiff back and neck because of our extra-large head. Women have more of the burden. An upright gait requires narrower hips, but human babies' heads are bigger. Because of this, evolution favored earlier births when their heads were still supple. Thus, humans are born helpless, unlike other animals' offspring. The result of this is that humans became social creatures, who can take care of each other. Ancient humans were at the middle of the food chain up to 400,000 years ago, and they reached the top 100,000 years ago. Normally, animals at the top of a food chain only achieved the feat after millions of years, while humans reached the peak comparatively quickly. Hence, the rest of the food chain and the humans, likewise, aren't used to this. Thus, we're prone to making bad decisions throughout history. The domestication of fire, estimated to start from 80,000 to 300,000 years ago, and cooking food may have enabled humans to evolve a big brain, while eliminating parasites and preparing food permitted the humans to eat different types of food. It also allowed a smaller intestinal tract, which allowed the brain to grow bigger. Aside from this, using fire as a weapon increased humans' edge over other animals. Even if early humans learned to use fire for their benefit, they were still marginal creatures around 150,000 years ago. Scientists don't know when Homo sapiens first evolved from other human types, but they agree that 150,000 years ago, East Africa was populated by them. They also agree that 70,000 years ago, they spread from East Africa to the Arabian Peninsula and to the Eurasian landmass. When Homo sapiens reached Arabia, most of Eurasia was already populated by other humans. There are two main theories of how Homo sapiens evolved. The interbreeding theory says that sapiens bred with Neanderthals, while the replacement theory states that they killed them off. It's also possible that a combination of these two have occurred. Eventually, many species of humans have become extinct, except Homo sapiens. The author says that Homo sapiens have settled so rapidly in diverse habitats, pushed other species to extinction, and conquered the world because of its unique language. The Tree of Knowledge 70,000 years ago, Homo sapiens left Africa for the second time, but this time they drove all other human species into extinction. In a short time, sapiens reached Europe and East Asia. They crossed the sea and landed in Australia 45,000 years ago. The period between 70 to 30,000 years ago has seen the invention of boats, oil lamps, needles, bows, arrows, art objects, and so much more. During this time, the first concrete evidence of religion 
commerce, and social stratification appeared. Most researchers believed that these accomplishments were the product of new ways of thinking and communicating among Homo sapiens. This marks the cognitive revolution. They are not sure why this happened, but some believe that it's caused by random genetic mutations that changed the wiring of the brain of Homo sapiens. This can be called the tree of knowledge mutation. Although animals have a form of language, Homo sapiens' language enabled them to communicate, store, and absorb a vast amount of information about the environment. With this information, the members of the tribe can brainstorm and cooperate with one another on various tasks. Gossip is another byproduct of this unique language. Because social cooperation is essential for the survival of Homo sapiens, survival and reproduction, individuals needed to know about their companions, such as who is trustworthy and who is not, who is an enemy, who are mates, etc. Only Homo sapiens can discuss things that are not tangible such as fantasies, legends, myths, deities, and religions. The ability to talk about fiction is unique in Homo sapiens' language. Fiction has allowed Homo sapiens to imagine things individually and collectively. Telling stories and myths allowed numerous individuals to cooperate in a variety of ways. Members of a coalition spend time together and help each other. The number of members that can be formed and maintained has limits. For a group to function well, all group members must know each other well. Chimps are unable to form groups with more than 50 members. As the number increases, the social order decreases and fractions form. The human groups can reach around 150. These groups are bonded by interaction and communication, which includes gossip. Beyond this number, it's hard to maintain cohesiveness from communication alone. Fortunately, humans manage to work in groups comprised of a thousand members and beyond because of common myths. Thus, members of the same state, religion, tribe, and city can collaborate on the same goal, even if they haven't met each other before. This is because they can agree on things like religion, laws, justice, nations, human rights, and money, even if these things only exist in their collective imaginations. These enabled people to trade and to build corporations. Since the cognitive revolution, humans existed in the physical and imagined reality. As time went by, the imagined reality became powerful enough to affect how people think and act. How a group of people works, with each other, can be affected by changing the stories that they believe in. As an example, the French population changed dramatically in 1789, when they stopped believing in the myth of king's divine rights, and believed in the myth of the people's sovereignty instead. At the end of the cognitive revolution, Homo sapiens were able to modify their behavior rapidly when their needs changed. They didn't need to wait for millions of years for a genetic or environmental change to happen. Thus, they zipped past all other human and animal species in their ability to cooperate with each other. A Day in the Life of Adam and Eve According to evolutionary psychology, our psychology and social characteristics are shaped during the pre-agricultural era. Even if modern technology has increased our lifespan and gave us access to more material resources, we still have the minds of a hunter-gatherer. Thus, to understand things about us like our eating habits, sexuality, and conflict, it helps to look back in history on how things were thousands of years ago. For instance, craving high-calorie foods are embedded in the DNA. Food rich in calories used to be rare and hard to find so the instinct to immediately consume it is programmed into the genes. Modern times have made food readily available, but the instinct has remained. Thus, people are prone to overeat. Ever since the agricultural revolution, humans didn't have a predominant way of life. There are vast cultural differences even among people living under the same ecological conditions because of the ability to create different imagined realities, values, and norms. Before the agricultural revolution, Homo sapiens tribes were isolated from one another, 
Even though they participated in a common activity every once in a while, they were nomadic, moving from place to place to find food. Tribe members were close to one another, and they didn't have much privacy. They were also less lonely. They first learned to tame animals by domesticating dogs 15,000 years ago. These dogs helped them to hunt food and provide security. Eventually, they managed to tame other animals as well. In places with plenty of food supplies, the tribe settled seasonally and sometimes permanently. Food preservation techniques enabled them to stay longer. Fishing villages were one of the first settlements, and they may have initiated transoceanic journeys, such as the invasion of Australia. Ancient humans did not only forage food, but knowledge as well. They were more aware of their physical environment as compared to us. Contrary to common belief, they were not unintelligent. Currently, humans now know more than what our ancestors 15,000 years ago knew. However, as individuals, our knowledge is highly specialized into a few things. Thus, we have to rely on other experts whose knowledge are likewise specialized. Scavengers worked fewer hours in a week compared to the modern humans, and were fitter than modern humans too. Thus, the author argues that we've made a mistake when we turned away from this way of life. Aside from this, agriculture and industry made it easier for people to depend on one another— to survive instead of being self-reliant like the old times. Researchers don't know much about foragers' religion, but they theorize that they were animists who believe that every plant, animal, place, and natural phenomenon has feelings and awareness. They also did not know much about their socio-political world, but fossils and artifacts hint at how it might have been years ago. The Flood Humans traveling across the sea and arriving in Australia 45,000 years ago is considered as one of the most important expeditions. It's the time when humans scaled the food chain. After a few thousand years, 23 out of 24 animal species in the continent became extinct. 800 years ago, the Maoris colonized the New Zealand islands, and their arrival also marked the disappearance of most of the animals there. Mammoths in Wrangell Island in the Arctic Ocean were wiped out 10,000 years ago, when Homo sapiens spread over Eurasia and North America. This reveals that sapiens have a destructive effect on the ecology of the place they inhabit. It's theorized that they burn forests to create farmlands, thus contributing to mass extinctions. Because Homo sapiens learned to create clothes and shoes against the winter, they could migrate to colder places, like Siberia, even if their bodies were adapted to conditions in the African savanna. They gradually reached the eastern United States, the Mississippi Delta, Mexico, and Central America, when the global temperature rose and glaciers, blocking their way, melted. The settling of the humans in America represents the most rapid invasion of a single species— By 10,000 B.C., Homo sapiens occupied the entire landmass of America. Within 2,000 years after their arrival, most of the species in it were gone. Other ecological disasters took place in almost every island across the seas. The first wave of extinction took place during the invasion of the foragers, while the second wave extinction came with the spread to the farmers. The third wave extinction is currently being caused by industrial activity. During the cognitive and agricultural revolutions, only the land animals were affected by human activities. However, in our modern day, sea animals are also doomed because of pollution and overuse of oceanic resources. If this trend continues, the only survivors of the human flood will be the Homo sapiens. The Agricultural Revolution History's Biggest Fraud For 2.5 million years, Homo sapiens consumed food that grew without their intervention. They spread from East Africa to the Middle East, Europe, Asia, Australia, and America, gathering plants and hunting animals. That changed 10,000 years ago, when they began to manipulate plant and animal species to gain more grain, fruit, and meat which heralded the dawn of the Agricultural Revolution. The Agricultural Revolution rose independently in several parts of the world, 
Various plants and animal species were domesticated. Goats, dogs, wheat, peas, lentils, olive trees, horses, grapevines, camels, cashew nuts, and more. By 3500 BC, the main wave of domestication halted. Nowadays, 90% of calories come from what our ancestors have domesticated, around 9,500 to 3,500 B.C. These are wheat, corn, rice, potatoes, barley, and millet. Our minds are from hunter-gatherers, while our cuisine is from ancient farmers. Not all plants and animals were suited for domestication, though as agricultural revolutions only occurred in places where sapiens have managed to domesticate the flora and fauna. Scholars have claimed that the agricultural revolution was a significant leap forward for humanity because it produced more intelligent people. However, there's no evidence that modern humans became more intelligent through time. Ironically, the first few thousand years of the agricultural revolution made life harder because it created more work, less time for leisure, and an increasing population that required more food. It also turned some individuals into elites that were pampered by workers. These unfavorable conditions were not caused by people, but some plant species that includes rice, wheat, and potatoes. The author claims that they domesticated Homo sapiens rather than the other way around. Because human bodies were not adapted to farming, various ailments, like slipped discs, hernias, and arthritis plagued farmers. Also, it forced them to settle and guard their farms, even if they can get better food through hunting and gathering. Agricultural village life did provide benefits, though. It protected people from wild animals and harsh weather, and it caused people to be less violent to one another the agricultural revolution didn't improve the life of the average person at first. However, it did enable humans to gather more food per unit area. Thus, the overall population increased exponentially. Even if individuals were not really happier or healthier, they were able to pass on more genes. Thus, the agricultural revolution can be considered as an evolutionary success, even if it was a trap. Each generation didn't notice how things were becoming worse, because these changes were gradual. They didn't see that becoming too dependent on wheat robbed them of nutrition, forced them to work harder, and required them to guard their storehouses. They didn't return to the old ways, because working on the farm took a lot of time. They just thought what they were doing a good thing by making a lot of food. In history, luxuries tend to become necessities that create new obligations. When people learn to enjoy the new luxuries, they become dependent on them. The agricultural revolution's evolutionary success, a greater population, was the cause for much suffering inflicted upon humans and domesticated animals, such as chickens, pigs, cattle, and sheep. These animals are often treated cruelly. Similar to Homo sapiens, even if the cattle are continuously bred and are successful evolutions, it does not mean that they're happier. Building Pyramids The agricultural revolution has created people who are greedy and who are alienated from nature and their fellow humans. It's caused people to be stuck in places that are good for yielding crops, forcing them to stay on a mere 2% of the Earth's surface. This revolution became the time when worrying about the future became common. Before this, people were rarely concerned, since they couldn't do much about it. The advent of agriculture meant that people can do something about the future, and thus they gained more obligations. Farming became the basis of large-scale social and political systems. Unfortunately, the peasants did not achieve future economic security. Elites and rulers lived off the surplus food the farmers produced and gave back very little. Food surplus and transportation technology enabled people to live together in large villages, which grew into towns, cities, and kingdoms. These alone were not enough to make them live together effectively, though. An imagined order must be made to make thousands of people believe in the same ideas, for them to understand one another and to work towards the same goals. 
To make people believe in an imagined order, it should not be admitted that it's imaginary, but an objective reality dictated by the laws of nature, or by the gods. It should also be incorporated into education, and to everything that people encounter. To fairy tales, songs, architecture, fashion, political propaganda, etc. It's quite difficult for people to realize that the imagined order is indeed imaginary because it's reflected upon material reality. It shapes desires, and it exists as an intersubjective reality that's maintained by several thousands of people. The myths surrounding us and making up our lives influence a lot of what we believe in and what we do. A lot of people spent their lives building pyramids of varying names, sizes, and shapes, depending on the culture, even if they were not sure why they did so. To change the imagined order, it should be replaced by an even more powerful order. And that's why there's no way out of it. Breaking down the prison wall simply means escaping into the yard of a bigger prison. Memory Overload Sapiens' social order is imagined, so they can't preserve the information by embedding it in the DNA and passing it to their children. Because of this, they need to consciously make efforts to preserve the social order by sustaining laws and customs. Empires generated vast amounts of information which went far beyond what individuals can memorize. Thus, humans searched for a way to keep information so they do not become dependent upon individual brains and the answer to their problem, writing. Aside from storing information, writing was invented to record numbers, because human brains did not evolve to handle numbers well. It's much more suited for remembering zoological, botanical, social, biological, and topographical information, because of sapiens' evolutionary history. To overcome the problem of storing large amounts of data, including numbers, The Sumerians invented writing between 3500 and 3000 BC. Writing changed man's thought process and has enabled us to keep records and think categorically. It has preserved information beyond what the mind can retain and the genes can encode. The first Sumerian historical texts were limited to figures and facts. They are economic documents detailing things like property ownership, tax payments, and debt accumulation. This is because writing consumed a lot of time and there were only a few who could read. Sumerian writing started out as a particular script that could not fully express their language but dealt with limited functions, such as recording figures and performing calculations. Gradually, more signs were added to it until it evolved into a full script, known as cuneiform script. Since then, more documents were written. Aside from the Sumerians, different cultures invented their own system of writing. They also found ways to archive, catalog, process, and retrieve records. Because of writing, Homo sapiens began to think differently. They learned how to think beyond free association and to think categorically. They also gained the ability to handle numbers. There's no justice in history. Humans had organized themselves in networks, requiring mass cooperation by creating scripts and imagined orders. These orders were not fair because they divided people into groups that were ranked in a hierarchy. The top levels had power and privileges, while those on the bottom were oppressed and discriminated. Examples include the caste system of India and racial discrimination in America. The imagined hierarchies are put in place by dominant people to preserve their position in society. To make people accept these structures, mythology, laws, and assumptions are quoted. The hierarchical ranks are deliberately separated from each other to keep everyone in their proper place. Intermarriages are prohibited and the rise of status of a low-ranking individual almost never happens. Hierarchies tend to create vicious cycles that can go on for hundreds or even thousands of years. For instance, Americans imported the blacks from Africa because they were cheaper and fitter. These slaves were often treated harshly and labeled as an inferior race. This made them rebellious, prompting the whites to set discriminatory laws to control them. 
Due to these laws, the slaves grew poor and remained uneducated. The people developed cultural prejudices about them, leading to more discriminatory laws and dire conditions for the blacks. There is also inequality among the genders. Historically, men were treated better than women, with some cultures even considering wives as the property of their husbands. Men dominated ruling positions while women were not allowed to vote for a long time. A few theories have attempted to explain this gender inequality. One says that men have evolved to be more dominant than women because those who are not strong enough get killed off more easily. Also, their greater power meant that they were better in manual labor, such as plowing and harvesting. Thus, they were in control of the food supply, giving them a political clout. They could have easily forced women into submission as well. This is problematic because physical power does not always translate to social power. The elderly often has authority over those in their twenties, even if the latter are physically more capable. Rulers were often not the strongest or most violent, but possessed great social skills. Again, scholars are not sure as to why most societies are patriarchal and dominated by men, but the good thing is that women are now treated more equally. The Unification of Mankind The Arrow of History All human cultures have inconsistencies within them. For example, the medieval Europe believed in Christianity and chivalry. People throughout the world struggled to reconcile with the terms liberty and equality ever since the French Revolution. Contemporary Americans are divided between Democrats and Republicans. This is not something really bad because they make people think critically and encourage creativity and dynamism in the culture. Scholars used to think that cultures are static, but they eventually realize that they constantly change. The changes may be due to the environment or the influence of an invader. However, sometimes it can happen without these two factors. Overall, cultures are moving towards unity. For example, there used to be thousands of separate human worlds on Earth during 10,000 BC, but they dwindled in number by 1450 BC. At that point, 90% of humans lived in one mega-world, Afro-Asia. The remaining 10 was divided among four worlds, the Mesoamerican world, Central America, and portions of North America, the Andean world, most of Western South America, the Australian world, Australia, and the Oceanic world, islands in the South Pacific Ocean. The Afro-Asian world gobbled up the Mesoamerican world in 1521 when the Spanish invaded the Aztec Empire and the Oceanic world then when Ferdinand Magellan circumnavigated the globe. The Andean world was defeated in 1532 when the Spanish conquistadors toppled the Incan Empire. The British colonized Australia in 1788, 15 years later. They settled in Tasmania. Thus, all human worlds were brought into the Afro-Asian sphere of influence. The first millennium BC has witnessed the development of three potentially universal orders. The economic monetary order, the political imperial order, and the religious order. Merchants, conquerors, and prophets believed that they could bring the entire human race under the same set of laws that would apply to everyone wherever they may be in the world. The last few centuries have led to the growth of empires and the intensification of trade, which have contributed to increasing levels of global unification. The next chapter tells the readers how each of these orders has influenced history. The Scent of Money People used to barter goods, which presented problems because of several reasons. Traders had to constantly adjust their exchange rates. Items being traded were sometimes unwanted, and many material goods were hard to transport. To solve these issues, money was invented. The first kinds of money to be used were cowrie shells, barley, and metallic coins. These were easier to handle compared to random items, with the exception of barley. The coins and shells do not have a physical value to them. A barley can be eaten. 
but they contained an imagined value that's trusted by those who use them, and this value was convertible to a list of other things. Because money required people's trust, rulers and authorities made sure that the money that their people used was usable. Counterfeiting money resulted in severe punishments to deter cheaters. People from different religions and cultures learned to use various kinds of money. This resulted in the worldwide acceptance of money. Nowadays, most of the people's money is purely intellectual, with only 10% existing in physical form and 90% in electronic form. Despite this, complex commercial networks and dynamic markets thrive. The author claims that money has become the apogee of human tolerance. Ironically, though, it has also caused people to be heartless. People have learned to sacrifice priceless values like loyalty and empathy for the sake of money and the things that can be bought by it. Imperial Visions An empire is a political order ruling over a vast number of people with distinct cultural identities and territories. It has flexible borders and a potentially unlimited appetite. The world has seen many empires throughout history. The Chinese Qin Dynasty Empire, the Roman Empire, the Akkadian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Aztec Empire, and the British Empire are some of them. For the past 2,500 years, empires have been the most common form of political organization and were instrumental in gathering small cultures and turning them into bigger cultures. Although there are many disadvantages of being conquered, there are also advantages. The blending of empires often starts a new culture. This includes architecture, music, art, cuisine, governance, and more. The imperial cycle starts with a small group establishing a big empire. Along with this is the forging of a culture. The Roman Empire created the Greco-Roman culture. The Arab Caliphate upheld an Arab-Muslim culture. And the European empires paved the way for the Western culture. The imperial culture is adopted by the subjects. Thus, the conquered take up their conqueror's language, laws, political ideas, religions, etc. Although the subjects tried to behave like their masters, they were considered inferior and treated unfairly. This led them to demand equal status in the name of common imperial values. Roman values, Muslim values, nationalism, socialism, human rights, and so on. After some time, the empire's founders lost their power and the control got transferred to a multi-ethnic elite. Despite the dissolution of the empire, the imperial culture continues to develop. Thus, the Illyrians, Gauls, and Punic continue the Roman culture. The Egyptians, Iranians, and Berbs keep the Muslim culture alive, while the Indians, Africans, and Chinese maintain the Western culture. Most of what we believe as part of our own culture was forced upon us by other empires that conquered our ancestors. As a whole, we are now moving towards one global empire. There are numerous issues that can only be tackled effectively when countries cooperate. Issues such as global markets, global warming, and human rights require one collective entity, which may require one world government. The Law of Religion Religion is a system of human values and norms that are based on a belief in a superhuman order. Many say that religion divides people, but it's actually the third unifier of mankind, aside from empires and money. It has two characteristics that enable it to unite distinct groups of humans over a large territory. It's believed to be universal or always true everywhere, and missionary, that it should be spread to everyone. The agricultural revolution occurred along with a religious revolution. It's theorized that when people learned how to control nature, they invented gods to help them control it more when they fail. This led to the rise of polytheism. It's interesting that polytheism is more tolerant of multiple beliefs, even if it's considered as less enlightened than the beliefs people have today. For polytheism, there's a god for everything, and people can worship any god they want. This changed when some religions like Christianity and Islam decided that one god is above the rest, because they believed that they knew the ultimate truth. 
they discredited the belief in other gods and often imposed violence for over 2,000 years. They also turned the local gods and goddesses into saints from their religion. Buddhism is a religion that does not promote worship, but instead advocates the liberation of man from suffering. According to Buddhist belief, the mind naturally craves more, and all suffering arises from this craving. The Buddha prescribed guidelines to help people achieve enlightenment, a reminder that even if people claim that Buddhism is not a religion, it still tells people what to do and believe. The last 300 years have witnessed an increasing secularism in the world. This included the progression of ideologies that are based on natural law, such as communism, nationalism, capitalism, and Nazism. These are not usually known as religions, but the author considers them as such, because they're still systems of values and norms founded on a belief in a superhuman order. Humanist religions are those that are said to worship man. The author says that these arose from monotheism. Liberal humanism believes that humanity resides in each individual, homo sapiens, and that people should protect the core and freedom of each individual. Socialist humanism argues that humanity is collective, and thus it's imperative to protect equality within the entire homo sapiens species. Evolutionary humanism claims that humanity is a mutable species that might evolve into superhumans or degenerate into subhumans. Thus, evolution should be safeguarded and de-evolution prevented. Nazis upheld evolutionary humanism, and they fought human rights, communism, and liberal humanism to improve the entire species and prevent its degeneration into extinction. They exterminated many people for this. Thus, it has become taboo. However, Even if exterminating inferior kinds of people is shunned, many are still eager to create superhumans. Liberal, political, and judicial systems are based on the belief that a soul must be protected. However, since science has not found any evidence of the existence of a soul so far, the author ends this chapter wondering how long the wall, dividing biology from law and politics, can stand. The Secret of Success Commerce, empires, and universal religions gradually brought virtually all sapiens into a global world. We can't say for sure why they turned out that way, but we can study a few things. Describing how something happened involves recreating the series of events that led from one instance to another. Describing why something took place means finding causal connections that resulted in this specific series of events and not others. Some scholars provide deterministic explanations to events based on biological, ecological, or economic forces, but most of them are skeptical of such theories. They say that the more that you know about history, the harder it may be for you to explain why one outcome transpired and not a different one. History cannot be explained deterministically because of its complexity, and it cannot be predicted as well because many forces are involved. What seems obvious in hindsight is near impossible to predict beforehand. There are two kinds of chaotic systems. Level 1 is not affected by predictions about it. E.g., the weather is not influenced by weather forecasts, while Level 2 is influenced by predictions about it. For example, reports about oil prices will affect the stock market. History and politics are second-order chaotic systems. Despite its unpredictable nature, history is still worth studying. Not to determine what will happen, but to deepen our understanding of the present situation and our acceptance of possibilities. History is directed by powerful, impersonal dynamics that are beyond humans. There's no evidence that history is benefiting humans or humans' well-being over time. The spread of cultures is compared to the spread of an infectious disease. It's still a question as to whether history will benefit Homo sapiens collectively. The Scientific Revolution The Discovery of Ignorance The Scientific Revolution began in Europe approximately 500 years ago. 
During this time, humanity's impact grew tremendously, and as of now, we've achieved an unparalleled progress. The human population grew 14-fold, production 240-fold, and energy consumption 115-fold. We've circumnavigated the Earth reached the moon, learned about microorganisms, and defeated the diseases that they cause. Among the numerous events of this period that the author considers the most crucial is the detonation of the atomic bomb on July 1945 at Alamogordo, New Mexico. Now, humans had the capability not only to affect history, but to end it. Supporting this revolution is a feedback loop powered by the mutual reinforcement of science, economics, and politics. Economic and political institutions fund research, while science gives new powers to obtain new resources, with some of these being reinvested into research. Modern science is different from previous kinds of knowledge because of the following traits. The admittance of not knowing the focus on observation and mathematics, and the acquirement of new powers. Science assumes humankind does not know the answers to the important questions in life, while religion assumes that they are already known, and the answers to these are absolute. Previous cultures and belief systems created their theories from traditions and stories, while science formulated its theories with observations and mathematics. It seeks to go beyond what is previously known, and when necessary, change them to make them more accurate. At the time of the Industrial Revolution and the creation of the capitalist system, science, industry, and military technology came together. War provided the impetus to create more powerful weapons and more reliable defenses, sparking a lot of scientific discoveries. Scientific research can thrive only when supported by an ideology or religion. Science justifies the expenses of these researches, and the ideology determines what to do with the discoveries. The Marriage of Science and Empire The West dominated the last 100 years because the Chinese and Persians lacked the myths, values, sophistication, and judicial structures. The European imperialists traveled across oceans to seize new territory, and knowledge and discovering America was the turning point of the scientific revolution. This sparked their drive to conquer and explore. The Spaniards, headed by Pizarro and Cortes, committed genocide within South America, wiping out the Aztec Empire. Between 1750 and 1850, Europe conquered large areas of Asia. In 1950, Western Europe and the United States increased their global production. This has been attributed to their military-industrial-scientific complex, a powerhouse fueled by the ideology of exploration. The exploration missions of James Cook, Christopher Columbus, Ferdinand Magellan, and others are more than attempts to expand territory. They also brought back important scientific discoveries, such as cures for previously incurable diseases. Translations of Hieroglyphics and Charles Darwin's Theory of Evolution. This new knowledge has led to a vast array of applications that are now benefiting humankind. The conquests themselves are based on cleverness, where they took advantage of their visitors and their cluelessness of what's happening around them. Even if the conquerors were fewer than the conquered, they had superior technology and acted strategically. Thus, they were able to conquer the land swiftly. The author claims that Europe was once on an equal footing with India, China, and the Middle East in terms of knowledge and technology, but the later did not have the passion for exploring the unknown. Because of their drive to discover and conquer, they learned more things created more technology, which ultimately gave them more power over the rest of the people. The Capitalist Creed The scientific revolution is funded by capitalism. The per capita production skyrocketed when capitalism began. Previously, GDP increased at a steady pace because of demographic expansion and settlements on new lands, which changed when humans invented credit system. 
Credit allows people to borrow money because we believe that the future will be better than today. Thus, opportunities can open up if people build things in their present using the money which they believe they will make in the future. This is influenced by the scientific revolution and the idea that progress is possible. People learned that good things can come with inventions, discoveries, and developments. This created trust in the future, that there will be better resources, and thus it's okay to borrow what can be paid later. In the pre-modern economy, there's little trust in the future, and thus little credit is available, which leads to slow growth and less trust in the future until the cycle is repeated. In contrast, the modern economy is given much trust in the future, enabling much credit which opens up opportunities for fast growth and even more trust. Adam Smith mentioned in The Wealth of Nations that increasing private profits is the basis for increasing collective wealth. However, this only works for the profits that are not hoarded, but reinvested in new production. When one becomes richer, one can help everyone, and hence greed could be good. Capitalism is about capital, or resources invested in production. In the pre-modern economy, production is geared towards profits in a one-way process. On the other hand, the modern economy, production, and profits are linked in a cycle. Production creates profits, which is reinvested in production, leading to additional profits. It is religion that says economic growth is essential because freedom, justice, and happiness need a growth in the economy. European imperialism was likewise financed by capitalism, as it's based on credit rather than taxes, and it's guided by capitalists who want to receive something in return for their investments. Aside from that, many important events, like the Britain-China Opium War, Egypt paying off its debt for the Suez Canal, and Greece's liberation from Turkey are influenced a lot by capitalism and politics. The Wheels of Industry Everything used to be governed by manpower and animal power, which was determined by food, which is dependent on photosynthesis. Basically, humans were limited to what was available to them. When they learned to convert energy into another type of energy, more specifically heat into movement, things changed a lot. The Industrial Revolution has been all about energy conservation. The Industrial Revolution has been all about energy conversion. This started from the invention of the steam engine, a device that enabled speedy transportation and textile manufacturing. Gunpowder led to the development of improved artillery, and electricity has enabled us to do things that have never been done before, even if we don't understand it that much yet. As humans learned to harness and convert energy effectively, they exploited previously inaccessible collections of raw materials and transported them to distant locations. They were also able to invent and discover completely new materials. Besides this, their machines produced numerous items and perform a lot of work without being tired. The author considers the Industrial Revolution as the second agricultural revolution because machines have been heavily applied in agriculture. Tractors performed farmers' duties. Fields and animals yielded more products. Food storage and transportation became more convenient. Although this created an abundance of food for humans, it has oppressed all the other species. Since the modern capitalist economy needs to constantly increase production to maintain itself, it also acquired a need for consumers which gave birth to consumerism. Thus, people were made to buy stuff they really don't need, and things that can even harm them at times. Like religion, people are promised good things when they follow the capitalist consumerist ideal. But the truth is, only the greedy rich can benefit, while the poor remains enslaved to the system of needing more and buying more. A Permanent Revolution the Industrial Revolution has liberated mankind from its dependence on the environment. Today, there are 7 billion sapiens all around the planet. 
while animals do not even come close to this number. The progress of humankind came at the price of nature. Ecosystems are manipulated and at times destroyed to fulfill the wants and needs of humans. However, despite the seemingly dire conditions of the planet today, humans cannot kill it, but only change it. The planet has existed for billions of years. When an asteroid killed off dinosaurs, it led to the survival of mammals. Modern times saw drastic modifications. Humans are no longer dependent on the cycles of nature. Instead, they go by industrial time which sometimes makes them wake up and sleep at unnatural hours. Other examples include urbanization and the decrease of the peasantry, the emergence of the industrial proletariat, and the disintegration of patriarchy and the rise of youth culture. One major upheaval is the collapse of the family and local community. For the past two centuries, the Industrial Revolution provided the market new powers, and the state new means of transportation and communication. It also gave the government people like social workers, policemen, teachers, and clerks. These factors gave the government the ability to take over the family and community's role in keeping the peace, making decisions, and dictating what the people should follow. International violence has dropped as well. After the collapse of empires, the independent states are no longer interested in war. Even among the Arabs, there have been no massive wars aside from the Gulf War in Africa. Only a few countries have invaded each other. This is explained by the following factors. The price of war rose dramatically. Using weapons like nuclear bombs meant collective suicide, and the war profits declined accordingly. Today, wealth is composed of human capital, socioeconomic structures, and technical knowledge while well, peace became lucrative. Trading rather than war has become more profitable. Lastly, nowadays the elite in the world are mostly peace-loving, unlike the rich in the past ages. And they lived happily ever after. The last 500 years have transformed the world into a single historical and ecological unit. Humans as a whole now enjoy an incredible amount of wealth and potentially limitless energy. Politics, social orders, daily life, and ways of thinking have transformed radically. However, the author claims that we are not really happy as a species. This is because happiness is dependent not on external factors, but on internal factors. Satisfaction with what is currently present is more important than getting more of what is wanted. Expectations play a part, too, and because people are exposed to high standards, they may feel bad about not being as beautiful, rich, or smart as the media tells they should be. Happiness is determined by a system of neurons and biochemicals, which seem to be programmed to maintain happiness levels to be fairly constant. Thus, even if good things are happening, it can provide a brief sensation of happiness but does not make humans happier. One result of our historical development is that we now have in our hands ways to alter our biochemistry. The study of the human mind made us realize that we have the psychological means of making ourselves feel what we want to feel. A meaningful life can provide satisfaction, even during tough conditions, while a meaningless life is difficult regardless of how comfortable the person is. Thus, a person can choose his or her own meaning, even if it can be considered as a self-delusion. Buddhism offers a way out of delusion by giving the advice to know oneself well and to ignore both feelings and external circumstances. The author observes that so far, our understanding of history failed to make us learn what influences people's happiness and suffering. The End of Homo Sapiens it's only until recent times that sapiens were capable of breaking free from biologically determined limits. Although we've previously learned how to go beyond these limitations through selective breeding of animals, we now know about life at the cellular and nuclear levels, and in so, we could do so much more. We could now design creatures according to our tastes by manipulating stem cells and genes, Aside from genetic engineering, we're now becoming better at cyborg engineering. 
We are programming robots and using robotic components to supplement our own capabilities. Devices like retina implants, bionic arms, and other gadgets are replacing defective biological parts, which makes us wonder if we can make a complete cyborg eventually. It's also possible that we may create an inorganic life that can undergo its own evolution, turning us into a god of sorts. Despite breathtaking jumps in our evolution, there may be some features that remain. For example, the wealthy elite may create further inequality through biological and medical engineering, but we cannot predict that yet. There may come a point of the singularity when all the meanings we ascribe to the world will lose their relevance. We could also be replaced by our very own creations, like a rebellious Frankenstein. The author leaves us with this haunting quote, that we should not ask what we want to become, but what do we want to want? There's nothing more dangerous than being dissatisfied and irresponsible gods who don't know what they want. Homo sapiens have a mind-bogglingly long history before it. 13.5 billion years since the start of everything. 3.8 3.8 billion since the emergence of organisms on the planet, 2.5 billion years since the evolution of Homo, humans, and 200,000 years since Homo sapiens first evolved in Africa. It took a long time and tremendous transformations to create us and the world we have today. The question is, do we still have time in our future, especially now that we're becoming a danger to ourselves? Our collective accomplishments have liberated us from our dependence on nature, which has shaped us over millions of years. We've become the dominant species on the planet and have harnessed virtually all natural resources from the environment. Also, we've learned to create new materials and energy. This could lead to future progress or our inevitable destruction. Perhaps, looking back at everything that has happened before our time will make us truly wiser. Hopefully, we, or our future generation, will leave the planet a better place than before. Takeaways Homo sapiens are just one species of humans which evolved from the great apes. Homo sapiens dominated over other human species because of one crucial evolutionary advantage, a bigger and smarter brain. Our ability to communicate, transmit information, and believe in myths, or ideas not based in reality, has led us to be more cooperative with one another. Our cooperation has led us to do more things that other humans and animals were not able to do. Many truths we believe are in fact myths. Religion, money, human rights, laws, social structures, and more. But they are still important, and they hold societies together. Wars and conflicts can be considered as incompatibilities in myths, and because money functions the same for almost all cultures, it serves as a unifier among people. The scientific revolution represents the time when Homo sapiens realized that we don't know everything, but we can explore the unknown. Homo sapiens can now destroy itself, but it can upgrade itself too. Thus, it needs to be more responsible about its decisions. 